Welcome back to 12 Steps to Poker Heaven. I'm Carmel Thomas and with me is our in-house poker expert, Mr. Rob Smith. Thank you, Carmel. Still I'm, blushing? Oh, yes, I'm <laughs> blushing on the inside. All this praise is going to my head. Brilliant. Well, in our first part, we talked about winning tournament poker. Yeah, tournament poker is really what it's all about. You can be a cash player and you can grind out a nice little living at your local casino or online. But if you want to go for gold, if you want to win a blue ribbon event, then really you've got to enter a tournament. That's when you can translate your relatively small buy-in in the matter in, in a matter of days or hours into millions. You can literally go from zero to hero in a very short time. It's not so much earning a living as winning the lottery. Absolutely. Well, now we're going to move on to step 12, the final rung of our poker ladder. OK, Grub, I've read the books. I understand the rules. I can make the odd poker move. I'm done. I'm ready to win. Well, there's still a little bit of work to do. Luckily, it's pretty easy to get to your poker office. All you have to do is go along to your local club or casino, or even easier, perhaps, get online. Now, online, you can even play with pretend money. Uh, you mustn't ever think, just because you've read some books, <laughs> that your learning has finished. Poker is a journey that doesn't necessarily have an end. If you look at even the top players, the Doyle Brunsons, the Daniel Negranus, the Phil Ivies, they will be analysing the way they play, even though they've been doing it, in Doyle Brunson's case, for nearly 70 years. They don't relax. Uh, they know that, uh, that there's always something to learn. When you, even if it's just playing a new player, um, or perhaps uh, a new type of player. What happened with the internet is you've got a lot of young, especially Scandinavian players, who came in and were super aggressive. They were, they were very, very loose and, f and they made huge bets on just draws. And the old guard actually had to readapt for a couple of years to mm. catch up with these guys. So there we go, Carmel. All I'm saying is, it's good that you know what you know, <laughs> but don't ever think you know everything. Absolutely. Well, as part of our revision, let's look at everything we've learned throughout the series. In step one, we learnt an introduction to poker. That's it. We started with the ranking of the hands, all the way from just a high card to the royal flush right at the top. Uh, we learnt how to play Texas Hold'em, which is one of the many varieties of poker, but it's called the Cadillac of poker, and it's the one most commonly played. We also learnt a few technical terms. Uh, we learnt about the button, which represents the dealer. Uh, we learnt about the small blind, the big blind, being under the gun or first to act, in the cutoff just before the button. Just a few of the sort of terms which a beginner might be frightened by, but which you need to know to master the game. And in step two, we talked about hole cards. That's it. Those are the two cards you get before the flop, turn and river come down. They're very important. Obviously, the best two you can get are pocket aces. You can play those in pretty much any position. But speaking of position, we learned how that affects the value of your hole cards. If you've got a hand, say, like 9, 10 of clubs, what we call suited connectors, well, in early position, it's not that powerful because you, you might well see a raise. But in late position, you can actually raise with it yourself. Again, you've got to see how everyone else is playing and adapt your strategy to how weak or how strong you think they are. In step three, we talked about pre-flop. That's it, pre-flop play. How to conduct yourself when you first sit down at the table. Well, the first thing to do is look at your opponents. A lot of poker players don't use their eyes. You can see whether someone's looking really tired. You can see whether someone's maybe a bit drunk. And if some guy's doing really complicated chip tricks and he's wearing a World Series bracelet, well, then you should try and notice that because he's probably a very good player. When a poker game starts, you should be looking at how you behave as well. You don't want to rush into anything. You can sit there for a couple of rounds and find out what sort of players you're up against. And in step four, we looked at post-flop play. Yeah, this is very much the cutting edge of poker. There are three community cards out there. You're usually up against far fewer opponents than you were pre-flop, so you, you've got a lot more information and you're going to have a much better idea of where you stand. There are still things to watch out for. We spoke about the danger of over-betting top pair. But as we saw on our ranking of hands chart, a pair is actually the second worst thing you can have. So you mustn't get too excited. Much better to make a bet of about a third or half the pot to find out where you are. Don't put all your money in there, because somebody may turn around and snap on you like a mousetrap. Conversely, we spoke about the danger of slow playing. Let's say that you've got pocket sevens and the flop comes down with a seven in it. You've now got a set of sevens. You think, right, I'm going to soft pedal this, let everybody else bet, and then I'll, I'll be the one snapping the mousetrap shut. But of course, if that flop has got, say, a couple of spades in it, or it's got some cards which might give someone a straight, then really you're allowing them to draw very cheaply to a hand which will suddenly make yours look tiny. In step five, we talked about common beginner mistakes. 
That's true, and the most common one is probably playing too many hands. Mm. You don't want to get involved all the time. Sit there and wait till you get decent cards. Also, you don't want to play above your bankroll. If you've only got £1,000 to gamble with this year, you don't want to enter a game where the minimum bet is £100. You won't have enough leeway in case you run into some bad luck. You don't want to go on tilt. That's when you let your emotions take charge after you've received a bad beat or someone's been yapping in your ear and you start to play with your heart instead of your head. Don't do it. It'll cost you money. And then, of course, there are hiding your tells. Now, some players will tremble when they're excited. Some players will look back at their cards if uh, a possible straight or flush comes on the board. Other players, and not just beginners, will look at their chips when they see a flop and they know they want to bet at it. And if you're looking out for those tells rather than giving them away, then you're on the road to success. In step six, we talked about bluffing. And this is what makes poker the great game it is. You don't have to have the best hand to win. You can just use the power of your personality to force people to throw away better hands. There are a couple of types of bluff. The main, main two are the semi-bluff. That's where you've got, say, two cards to a straight. So you've got a jack and a nine, and there's a ten, eight, three out there. So you've got a straight draw, and you might get lucky, but you'd rather not wait to see whether fortune's on your side. Put a bet in now, hope to frighten everybody off, and take what you can. The other one is the pure bluff. And this is when you've got absolutely nothing. You've missed the flop and the turn, and maybe even the river, by a country mile. But you sense weakness in your opponent. Let's say he's a relatively tight, nervous player, and he puts in a, a small, weak bet. Well, if you've got the nerve, and you're prepared to stare him in the eye and push all your chips in, there's a good chance he will fold. In step seven, we talked about reading hands. That's it. Poker is a situational game, so you've got to be alert at all times. When someone's playing a hand against you, clock everything that they do. If they like to play with their chips a lot before raising, then you can watch that. So next time they do it against you, you'll know that there's a raise coming. And if you're not in a hand against them, you should still be watching everyone at the table, because they will be giving off messages all the time as if they had loud hailers. We spoke about situations. If you're up against a very short stack player, and you bet into him, you can be fairly sure that he's going to come back over the top for all his chips. He's got so little to lose. There are two poker players you really have to worry about, the one with very few chips and the one with a lot. Those are the ones who can really put chips into you. If you're playing against someone who's roughly the same stack as you, you've both medium stacked, it's probably going to be slightly more sedate and conservative. In step eight, we covered heads up. That's right. That's when there are only two of you left in a tournament. Everyone else has been knocked out. It's man against man or woman, and uh, the winner will be the one who walks away with the bulk of the prize money and the gold medal or the bracelet, whatever you're awarding. Uh, at this stage, it's not so much about the cards. It's, it's really a game of psychology and a game of aggression. You don't sit there waiting for aces and kings. If you did, you'd have to wait an awful long time. Any two cards become playable, and you've got to remember that when the flop comes down, mathematically, the odds are that your opponent has missed it. That's just the maths. You can't argue with it. With those three cards and the two in his hand, he's normally not going to connect. So if you have the moxie to push chips in there, it's going to be very, very hard for him to call. In step nine, we talked about psychology of poker. That's true. Poker is a mental game. It's a tournament between minds. You don't need to be strong to do it. You just need to be smart. And the psychology of poker is all about getting inside your opponent's head. What's he thinking? What does he think you're thinking? You want to mess with his head as much as possible. Now, you don't have to sit there passively just calculating. You can actually force him into certain thought patterns. You can laugh at him. You can criticize him. There are players known as trash talkers who will yap away in your ear, and they'll, they'll be, frankly, very, very rude about you. And they're always trying to get you to